Then I get on a bus and I'm sitting on this bus in the back seat, crying like a child, bawling like a baby. At this point, ambivalent, hoping one person will see my pain and ask me if I'm okay. Yeah. If something's wrong, can they help me? Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Squeeze. Thanks for joining us. Another Wednesday. Or whatever day it is you're listening to this. This, this would be true. Um, I'm Carl Tay. I'm Boy Tay. And if you are watching on YouTube right now, highly recommend. You will see that we also have our little angel Remington. Yeah. Lily was asleep on the couch and it felt like joining us today. No, she never wants to. But yeah. How we doing today, folks? We doing. We do it. We do good. I don't know if um, any of you have noticed if you're watching on YouTube, but um, we do have something new in the podcast room. We do. And that would be these beautiful new mic stands. Heck yeah. That are just, they're great. They're like weighted. You can just easily adjust them. They hide all the cords. They're very beautiful. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful sight. Yeah. It feels good. We're, we're upgrading for you guys. Yeah. It feels, it feels a little Only bougie. Only the best. Only the best for the squeeze. Um, I did have something fun to share. Well, what? first of all, we had our second solo episode last week. We did. Um, How'd you guys like it? What do we think? Let us know. Yeah. Send us an email or... Leave a comment down below. Yeah. And let us know what you thought. Yeah. Um, I was going to share, though, that, I mean, I, we've talked about it on here before, but I've... Honestly, like since our wedding, I've really struggled with um, working out, mm. with trying to get back in the gym or in a class and do something. I just have like not been motivated or wanted to. Yeah. Um, but I went for the first time in a while this morning and took a workout class and it was lovely. Woo! Let's oh, go. It was great. I, I missed it. it. You missed it. What, what was it? A bar class? Yeah. How was it? It was tough. Good. I mean, yeah, of course it's hard. Yeah. Bar is hard. People don't think that bar classes are hard because, like, it's very, like, um, what is it? Minimal movement. Isometric oh. movement. Like, it's, I don't know if that's the word. Don't quote me. Sorry. Okay. Workout people. Um, it's just, like, very, like, little, small movements. It's not, like. Yeah, but that burns. Oh, yeah, it does. I mean, there's me and then I'm, it was me and five other ladies who the youngest was probably, like, 50. Wow. And they're all like, I'm literally holding like these one pound weights because I was like, I'm not going to survive today. I could have done two, but I did one. Um, these ladies are literally holding like five pound weights, if not more, like doing all these things. And impressive. they're, yeah, it's, it's great. It's, it was very humbling, to be honest. Um, You'll work your way up. But it felt really good. And I felt good to be back. And it was definitely like good. I mean, we talk about it all the time. It's very, working out is so good for your mental health. Um, and we've just been so busy lately, um, that I feel like I needed to get back in there yeah. and do it. So if you've been contemplating getting back to working out, this is your sign. Highly recommend. Come do it with me. We will we'll do it together. We're in this together. Okay. Um, yeah. Go team. Proud of you. Thanks, honey. Well, ladies and gents, everyone listening, you are in for a treat. This week. Yeah. Because this episode is powerful. Yeah. We um we were very, very excited when we found out that um Mr. Kevin Hines was gonna come on our show and tell his story. Um we honestly don't want to get into the details too much of telling Kevin's story because only he can Tell it like he we want, does. Yeah, we want to do it justice, recapping it for yeah, you right now. Yeah, he has an unbelievable testimony, and um, um, it's just powerful. It's moving. It's touching, and he's for those for those listening and watching that don't know. Kevin jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, and survived. He's less than 1% of people to survive jumping yeah. off the Golden Gate. Um, yeah. And now he um, travels travels the world sharing his, his story and helping people 
uh, you know, how to look out for people who may be suicidal, motivating people to speak up if they are, uh, just lots of things that he will kind of dive into. Um, but if you missed our last episode, um, at the end of it, we had Dr. Chase Anderson on and he, we kind of sat down with him and dove into like the basic questions of suicide and suicidal ideation, what they are, myths about them, symptoms, uh, what to do if we think someone's suicidal, what to do if someone tells you they are, things like that. Um, and just to kind of help better prepare us for this episode and a few of our other upcoming ones that we have. Um, so if you haven't watched that yet, I highly encourage you to either go now and watch it or after this episode, if you still have some questions, obviously Kevin answers some questions, but, um, Chase does a very good job at, um, putting things into layman's terms and not using big scientific words that confuse yeah. people. Um, he works with children. So I think that is probably a big help, but For sure. he was lovely. So after this episode, head on back to our last one. It's like the last 15 minutes or so yeah. of last week's episode. Yeah. Um, so that'll help because we definitely learned some stuff. Um, I learned for the first time interviewing uh, Kevin that you can be chronically suicidal. I had no clue that that was a thing. Yeah. I guess I was just very ignorant to the thought of, you know, after someone has an attempt, like I, I never thought about and, what happened after that. And not to share too much, but like in, you know, Kevin's story, he instantly regretted it. Mm-hmm. So you just like, you'd think, well, if he, you know, went to do that and he instantly regretted it, yeah, you would just, you just assume that he wouldn't struggle yeah. with that thought ever again. Yeah. But that's just not the case. Yeah. I t- tons and tons of people struggle with chronic mm-hmm. suicidal ideation. Yeah. Um, and Dr. Chase talks about um, there's two different kinds yeah. of suicidal ideation. There's passive and active. And active. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was that was a really great thing to learn and be more aware of yeah yeah so we are just truly so excited we've been so excited to air this episode um and share it with you guys because the story is powerful and we learned a lot i'm excited for you guys to listen feel inspired um and yeah i hope you enjoy it yeah it's amazing um grab your tissue box no well we'll see you on the other side okay it's summer, so we are all looking for that perfect deodorant, that one that's going to it's gonna help us. Mm-hmm. But have you ever heard of a whole body deodorant? Whole, bo- whole body. You can use it at anywhere. What? Anywhere. Your pits, your privates, your anywhere you want. No. Lumi. It's the first of its kind. You can literally use it anywhere. On top of that, it's aluminum-free, baking soda-free, and paraben-free. Wow. Yeah, I know. And a special offer for our listeners today, new customers get $5 off a Lumi starter pack with code the squeeze at Lumi, L-U-M-E, deodorant.com. That equates to over 40% off your starter pack. Nice. Yeah. So visit the website, Lumi, L-U-M-E, deodorant.com and use code the squeeze. We got to try this out. Yeah. Kevin. Yes, Taylor. <laughs> From the bottom of our hearts, thank you for being here. We are fans of yours, truly inspired by your story, um, and just really never thought we would be able to get people like you on this show. So that's, I mean, that was our biggest goal, um, and it just feels surreal sitting here and having you in front of us. Oh, it means the world to me. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Well, you are both loved for all that you do too. So (laughs) we're fans. So thank you very much. Thank you. So before we get into all the fun, we kick off each episode with a game of Citrus Got Real. And in this jar, this lemon jar, are random questions. And if you don't mind, could you pull one for us? Okay. And read it. And um, I'd love to hear the answer. Okay. They're very, very serious questions. Okay. (laughs) Here we go. This is the one. Okay. Step back. Okay. If you could only watch 
one movie for the rest of your life, what would it be? I'm Great so glad question. that was the question because I have question. an immediate and amazing answer. Ace Ventura, Pet <laughs> Detective. Yeah. I would watch it over. And I, I mean, I did. I watched it probably a thousand. I am not your personal entertainer. Oh, God, I love that movie so much. And I love yes. the great Jim Carrey. Uh, he is a legend. Oh, and I, I mean, I would watch any of his movies over and over again. But that in particular is the one. That's a good one. Yeah. That's wow. a good one. I yeah. love that you knew that right away. I know. Didn't even need to think about it. I love the Truman Show, but that's a little hard to watch because, like, my brain lived that life. So, right. yeah. you know, psychosis is a is a terrible thing. I've so. seen you also talk about some, like, quotes and stuff that Jim Carrey has yeah. said. Yeah. So not only did you admire him as an actor, but also think he kind of smart at He's times. very smart, and his art is beautiful, and he is extremely talented. One of the things that uh, caught my attention to him is that, like, well, first of all, uh, his former wife... Uh, uh, and daughter are related to me through marriage. So oh. I always say I'm kind of related to Jim Carrey. Yeah. Love that. But, but, um, but he's my, he is my uh, absolute favorite actor of all time. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And he's a fascinating human. So fascinating yeah. human yeah. genius. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Wow. What would yours be? What would mine be? Oh, man. yours would be some Denzel Washington movie. <laughs> oh, it would be, what's the one with the kind that you love? Man on Fire. Yeah. You love that movie. Equalizer 17. <laughs> Yeah, I do. I know. I'm trying to think. I do. I do love Denzel. He can't really can't go wrong. do wrong. Um, yeah, Man on Fire definitely is a go to. Um, but it's, it's or, also a sad movie. Yeah. I don't know mm -hmm. if I want to be sad yeah. that often. Or a Sandler movie. <laughs> I think mine might be Anchorman if we're going with like the happy ones. Okay. That might be mine. Oh, Anchorman. Yeah. Yes. That is your like the go to airplane Farrell. movie. Yeah. All right. I like it. Okay, so summer is here and Ooh, it it's hot. Yeah. It's it's warm out. Um, and I've been feeling my wardrobe I could definitely use a little refresh. Yeah. I love I love pants and comfy clothes, but um not in this heat. Yeah, we need some this California heat is really um it's really getting 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 hot. Yeah. It's getting hot. It's there. Yeah. So that's why I'm excited to bring up Jenny Kane to you guys because you hear us talk about this brand all the time. We are truly such fans of them. Uh, every time we wear their clothes, we get compliments. Like, no, yeah. no it's true. They our, make our body compliments us as well because of the comfort. Yeah, the comfort is insane. They're known for their like super luxe cashmere sweaters, but they do summer very well. They're cotton. Yeah. Chef's kiss. They just dropped some a new summer collection. Yeah. And it's equally as awesome. It's equally as nice as their sweaters. And of course, they also have all of the home essentials that mm. that we love. The best. Yes. So head to JennyKane.com where you can find your forever pieces. Our listeners today get 15% off your first order. You can use code the squeeze at checkout. That's 15% off your first order at Jenny, J-E-N-N-I, Kane, K-A-Y-N-E.com. Promo code the squeeze. I don't know about you, but I am feeling dehydrated. <laughs> but thankfully. <laughs> well, well. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was going to say that, you know, when we think of like hydration or like electrolyte drinks, I feel like we think of like people who, you know, are doing sports or super active. But it's really important to literally, even if you're just sitting at home every day on back to back Zoom calls or whatever you're doing to make sure you are. Oh, yeah. Hydrated. And then especially in this summer heat. Yeah, Oof. especially in the heat. Um, so that's why we love Liquid IV. Um, you know, the flavor. Delicious. It's great. Yeah. They actually just came out with three new flavors. What? White peach, green grape, and lemon lime. Whoa. Yeah. We need to go to the store. I know. We do. White peach. I know. The flavors are great. And the packaging is just so easy for you to like bring on the go, whether it's to the office, to a workout, to wherever it is, you know, they just fit in your car, in your purse, uh, so easily. So they're super easy to travel with. But also, I like this. They're non-GMO, free from gluten, dairy, and soy, and they now have sugar-free options. Oh. Isn't that cool? Wow. Yes, so Game grab changer. grab your liquid IV hydration multiplier, sugar-free in bulk nationwide at Costco. Or get 20% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use code the squeeze at checkout. That's 20% off anything. And we mean anything um, you order 
when you use promo code the squeeze at liquidiv.com. Real people, real flavor, real hydrating, now sugar-free. Let's get hydrated. Well, my dear, I'm going to pass this to you Mm -hmm. because I know you got a lot to say. I do have a lot to say. Um, So Taylor kind of touched on just how excited we are for you to be here. And as like, we've known your story, but obviously doing some more research into you and just your whole story. um, Your story is very parallel to um, a close friend of mine that took his life in many ways. Um, So I kind of feel like this is like a cool moment for me. And I apologize if I'm emotional. I'm also, um, it's also my time of the month. So I'm a little (laughs) emotional today as it is. Um, But I kind of think this is just a really cool moment for me because I feel like I'm getting to ask my friend Jared like questions that I haven't, I wasn't able to ask him because his outcome um, wasn't the same as yours. so I'm just, I'm really excited as okay. emotional as I'm feeling. I'm just like really yeah. excited to be here to talk with you about yeah. that. Very well said. Yeah. Name was Jared. Yeah. yeah. May he rest in peace. He's over there on my, um, oh. on my desk, the bigger photo. Um, Jared, we love you. Yeah. He's the best. <laughs> um, okay. So obviously we're going to get into your big story of um, you attempting to take your life, but I want to kind of start from the beginning because i think that's also important to learn about you and i think it is a that's really where you like sorry to spoiler alert but that's where you like see so many similarities between like yeah jared and yeah kevin yeah so yeah if you start not start from the beginning but what was like home life like for you because i know you were kind of born into um a unstable family environment yeah uh, to, to say the least, uh, I, I was born to biological parents, I'm adopted, who had, uh, after they had me and my brother, uh, succumbed to severe uh, substance use issues mm-hmm. and uh, alcohol and hardcore drugs. And in my infancy and with my brother, who was 10 months older than me, you know, shotgun babies, uh, Irish twins, actually, sorry. And, um, we, uh, you know, I think I, I know that my birth parents loved us, Mm -hmm. but they had no resources. Mm -hmm. They had no help. They had no family with them and they struggled every day to survive. They had no money. Um, we, we were born in abject poverty. We lived in the worst neighborhood in San Francisco then the worst neighborhood there today. Mm -hmm. Um, we, 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 when we were born, we were in, in the first few months of our life living in crack motels, Mm. the places you pay for by the hour. And if you don't, you're out. And mom and dad did whatever they had to do to pay on that hour by that hour. Mm. Um, however illegal that they had to do it. Yeah. They did scored and sold drugs every day. Um, it's my understanding that my birth mom potentially had to sell herself. Mm. That was our life. Oh. And that meant that they neglected their two children all day long to go do score and sell drugs. Yeah. Leaving infants on a box spring for a mattress over a concrete slab floor. Had we have fallen, we would have cracked our heads open and died. Had we have touched the dangerous drug paraphernalia, sharp metal objects on the bed, it could have killed us. Until one day, one CD motel clerk made what I've always called his most unseedy decision. Mm-hmm. He heard our screams and cries of pure neglect one too many times, and he called the police. Mm. And the police came in with child protective services, and they swooped me and my brother up, smelling sour and putrid of our own filth, and they placed us into foster care. Um, in the form- in our formative months. We were fed what mom and dad could steal. Kool-Aid, Coca-Cola, and sour milk was our first diet. Mm. It's why I have so many gut health problems today. Mm. Um, And, you know, they didn't have the science back then that we have today about gut to brain health and about how your gut microbiome houses and creates all of your bodies and brain serotonin and dopamine affecting your mental well-being. Yeah. Imagine being fed from birth those 
severely processed and poisonous foods. Yeah. Um, so I was damaged from the very beginning of my life, emotionally, mentally, physically. And in foster care, my brother and I are bouncing around with one, one, one idea that we're going to be adopted together, but that's rarely what happens. And that's not what happened here. Mm. Mm. We both got a vicious strain of bronchitis in one of the foster homes and he died wow. seemingly right next to me. And I immediately developed a severe abandonment issue and uh, that I, that I have until today, every time somebody I love dies, I feel like they're leaving me on purpose and I can't shake it no matter how much therapy I do. And I do a lot of therapy. Yeah. Mm. Um, and I, uh, I was a sickly child and my brother passed away. I kept bouncing around in different homes, but unlike him, I got really lucky. Mm. I landed in the Heinz home mm. and obviously, you know, my last name, so this works out. Yeah. Debbie and Pat Heinz made me their son. Mm. And this was very special because they, they could have had natural born children. Yeah. But they took in three kids from three separate homes, wow. kids who had nothing and no one, kids who were born to parents who had mental struggles and drug use issues, and they saved our lives. Yeah. They saved us. Um, they're not perfect. They're flawed, but they're beautiful. And they saved us. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm mixed. My birth dad was half Mexican and half Italian. My birth mom was Jamaican, Black, African, Arawak, Indian, Portuguese, Scottish, Irish, English, and Sephardic Jew. And my brother's black, my sister's white. And I always say when people saw us, they were very confused. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and they made that known. But, you know, with all the racism we experienced, we didn't care because we were happy. Yeah. And growing up in that household was probably the most beautiful thing at the time that could ever happen to me. Yeah. And so I grew up, you know, and things were going great until they weren't. Mm-hmm. What? But when was that moment? And was that at what age were you diagnosed with bipolar disorder? When did you realize that? So, you know, like I said, we're growing up and, and loving life and thriving, right? You know, high school WCL wrestling champion, football team went to state on the speech and debate team for two days before they kicked me off, but I was there. <laughs> They're lost. <laughs> um, but at 17 and a half, it all came crumbling down. My brain broke. And my brain broke on a stage in a theater show in front of 1,200 people, a sold-out audience of one of Mr. John Fennell's plays. And he was the theater director. He was my hero. He was my mentor. He was my friend. He was my second father figure. And I'm on that stage playing the character Gatch in the show, How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying. Who's, and Gatch is like this flandering businessman. He's got the wife at home, but he's messing around with all the secretaries in the office. You know, mm-hmm. that guy. And I'm wearing one of my dad's old suits and ties that they'd hem to fit me because he's six one and I'm not. Mm. Um, um, and I looked out into the audience and now I, I, I've been having a hard time mentally for a while. Okay. I've been having these symptoms that I didn't know were called symptoms. Yeah. Mm. Paranoid delusions, hallucinations, uh, uh, depression, mania, uh, all of these things, uh, panic attacks, mm-hmm. heart palpitations, but I didn't know what they were. So I was quiet about it. Mm-hmm. My family knew I was unwell. They didn't know why. Okay. I didn't know why. And I'm on that stage and it, it's not even intermission yet. And I have a complete mental breakdown. And I begin to believe that 1,200 people are going to simultaneously rise, rush the stage, and end my life. So I run off the stage. And I run to the lobby, and Mr. John Fennell meets me there. He is, he is you know, uh, absurdly drunk. He could never bear to watch his show sober. Oh, wow. He had substance use disorder, just like my birth parents. Mm-hmm. And he, he approaches me in a drunken stupor. He goes, Kevin, can you please finish the performance? It's not even intermission yet. What are you doing? And I just babbled incoherent nonsense the next 10 minutes. I couldn't make out three words in a row that made sense. John called my mom. Mm -hmm. And my mom came to pick me up. I will never forget the look in her eyes. Because she 
I, I could see inside them that she saw within mine the depths of insanity brewing behind them. Yeah. She takes me to see my first psychiatrist and he diagnoses me with major depression. Mm. Puts me on those medications. I skyrocket into mania. He now knows I have bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. Triply diagnosed by three separate doctors, including him. But I didn't want bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. I didn't like the term. Yeah. I didn't want to be labeled mentally ill. Mm -hmm. So for the next two years, I lied through my teeth about what I was really going through so people wouldn't see me. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, I, in effect, got great. That's something a lot of us are good at, silencing my pain. Mm -hmm. And when you silence your pain and you bury all of your struggles, they only bubble and grow and fester uh, and, and, and until they burst. Yeah. In things like rage, aggression, violence, substance use disorder, eating disorder, suicidal thoughts, ideals, or actions. Yeah. And at 19, I couldn't keep it down anymore. Yeah. And I remember uh, on, on, as, as September rolled around of the year 2000, I was crying every day in my room. I was going to the bathroom mirror and self-loathing every day and looking in the mirror and hating what I saw. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was just, it was brutal. And, and then I was hearing voices in my head telling me I had to die, auditory hallucinations that I thought, were, were, I mean, they were, they were so real. Yeah. I was seeing things that nobody else could see. I believed them to be the only reality, but I didn't tell anyone. Not even your parents? Not even, my, my, my dad and mom had divorced. I was living with okay. my father. He and I were fighting every day, okay. arguing, screaming matches that should have had the police call. It was, it was terrible. And on September 24th, I sat in my room and I penned a note. A note to my mom, dad, brother, sister. I told them I loved them. I said I was sorry. I asked for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. I was going to take my life. And I had chosen the Golden Gate Bridge because I believe that it, you that I had understood you died upon impact, which yeah. most people do. You know, people say that people go to the Golden Gate Bridge for its beauty and to die there. I think that's nonsense. This whole romanticism of suicide is all, is a uh, is a is a it's it's a it's something people push to spread a narrative. Yeah. It's not real. People go there because they are in the greatest amount of lethal emotional pain they've ever experienced. Yeah. And they just want that pain to stop. Yeah, they're hurt. They're hurt. I mean, let me ask you, what is the one thing you want to happen when you find yourself in the most excruciating physical pain you've ever had? What do you want it to do? Disappear. Disappear. That's physical pain. Relate that to brain pain. Yeah. It's worse because everyone around you invalidates it. Yeah. I can't see it, so it can't be real. Yeah. And so... uh on September 25th, I, I convinced my father, who, who honestly did try to help me that day. Yeah. I convinced my father that I was going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And he drove me to City College. Never forget, he dropped me off at the kitty corner off the side of City College campus. And he said, Kevin, I love you. Be careful. He mm -hmm. said it every day. He knew. He, but he didn't know I was going to do this. He, yeah. just, he just knew something was off. Yeah. He didn't know how to, how to, how to, you know, nobody taught Pat Hines suicide prevention. Yeah. yeah. Nobody taught Pat Hines that when you have the inclination that someone is considering death by suicide, you must ask the questions. Are you thinking of killing yourself? Have you made plans to take your life? And do you have the means? Mm -hmm. Those questions are proven to get a more honest answer than even the question. Are you thinking about suicide? Or are you thinking of self-harm? Because the term suicide is such a taboo and self-harm is by definition, not suicide. It's self-harm. Uh-huh. So, and, and people think, oh, you put the thought in their mind. That's not real. That doesn't happen. Yeah. If the thought's already there, if they're thinking there, about it. If it's, it's not there, you're not going to implant it by asking the question. You're going to make sure they're safe. Yeah. Um, but people don't know that. So, yeah. so uh, my dad picks me up or drops me off and I go into class uh, at City College. I drop all of my courses with the counselor's department. They don't ask me one question. Hmm. Nine and a half units of 12 and a half units dropped in one moment. Not one question. No, who, what, why, where, when, how. Wow. 
I go to my last remaining class and I leave that class. I get on a muni train. Then I get on a bus and I'm sitting on this bus in the back seat, crying like a child, bawling like a baby. At this point, ambivalent, hoping one person will see my pain and ask me if I'm okay. Yeah. If something's wrong, can they help me? And as I'm sitting there crying, yelling aloud at the voices I'm hearing in my head, leave me alone, but I don't want to die. Why do you hate me so much? What did I ever do to you? And now 100 people are staring at me on a bus, but saying nothing. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the only man to my left says to the guy next to him, what the hell's wrong with that kid while laughing at me, mm -hmm. laughing at my pain? Oh. The bus gets to the Golden Gate Bridge parking lot. 100 people deboard right there. I'm broken. I'm hoping the driver will see me. He says, come on, kid, get off the bus. I got to go. I walked right up to him. Waterfalls are now flowing from my eyes. Mm. He's, he just motions for me to get off the bus. I walk across the span of the Golden Gate Bridge walkway. I pace back and forth for 40 minutes crying like a child. Mm. Bikers, joggers, runners, tourists, patrol officers searching for suicidal people go by me twice. And for those 40 minutes, you're waiting, hoping for anybody one to person. see your one pain. One person see me. Yeah. Please, God, see me. Say something to me. I can't say it out loud. I can't verbalize it. Yeah, give me a sign. The voices in my head were so loud, beckoning. You must die. Jump now. You must, it just over and over again. And I remember, and this is something I don't often share, but I'll, I'll share with you. I remember as an actor, I think you'll understand this. I remember uh, right when I found the particular light rail. Mm -hmm. I remember thinking of the film, What Dreams May Come, with Robin Williams. Because John Fennell, my theater director, seven months before my attempt, died by his hands. <laughs> it meant the world to me. <laughs> I remember thinking of that film, What Dreams May Come, with Robin, and how his wife passes away in the film, and she was his everything. and. He ends up dying and he wants to go to hell to bring her to heaven. Yeah. Mm. It's probably one of the most beautiful films I've ever seen. And I said, I said to myself, John, I'm coming for you. Mm. Delusionally. I was like, I'm going to go, yeah. I'm going to get you and I'm going to bring you to heaven. Yeah. And then a woman from my left approaches me. Blonde curly hair. Giant sunglasses. It didn't fit her face. <laughs> I look at her and she smiles at me. I think she's going to ask me if I'm okay. I don't have to do this. Yeah. I don't have to die today. She pulls out a digital camera and says, will you take my picture? Mm. I said, sure. She posed several times gave her a camera back. She said, thank you. And she walked away. And at that moment, I said to myself, the greatest lie I've ever told. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No one cares. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everybody cared. Everybody cared. And the voice in my head beckoned, jump now. And I did. Yeah. At the moment of free fall, instantaneous regret for my action wow. and the 100% recognition that I just made the greatest mistake of my life and it was too late. Wow. Yeah. I fell 250 feet, 25 stories, closing in on 80 miles per hour, nearing the speed of terminal velocity in four seconds. In those four seconds, I called out to God and begged him to live. Yeah. Mm. I hit the water, immediately shattered my T12, L1, L2 lower vertebrae into shards, missed severing my spinal cord by two millimeters, went down 70 feet, and was drowning, and I didn't want to drown. All I wanted to do was live. Mm -hmm. mm. But I thought it was too late. 
I frantically swam to the surface. I got closer and closer, and I thought, I'm not going to make it. Mm -hmm. This is where I go. What have I just done? I remember saying to myself, Kevin, you can't die here. If you die here, no one will ever know you didn't want to. Yeah. Wow. No one will ever know you knew you made a mistake. I broke the surface of the water. I bobbed up and down and I prayed, God, please save me. I don't want to die. I made a mistake. On repeat, he heard me. Mm -hmm. A woman driving by in a red car saw me go over the rail, called her friend in the Coast Guard, who happened to be manning the waters of the bridge at that moment. The only reason they got to me in a timely manner before I would set in hypothermia was because of that phone call. Yeah. In the water, I kept going down. I couldn't get back to the surface. Boots waterlogged, long sleeve pulling heavy. Mm. And I really think I'm going to die here. Yeah. What did I do? And that's when something begins to circle beneath me. I was like, you got to be kidding me. I didn't die jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge and a shark is going to devour me. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> it turned out to be a sea lion. And the people above looking down believed it to be keeping my body afloat until the Coast Guard boat arrived behind me. If you don't call that a miracle, I don't know what is. <laughs> yeah. Um, I affectionately named the creature Herbert. Mm -hmm. Herbert saved my life that day. Um, thank you, Herbert. Thank you, Herbert. Coast Guard arrived. They were amazing. The doctor at the hospital, Dr. Jonathan Levin, who I just, just had a reunion with oh. after 22 years. Oh, wow. wow. Dr. Jonathan Levin, um, he asked me to do the grand rounds speech at his event, at his, uh, at his, uh, hospital event. And, he saved me the ability to stand, walk, and run. Wow. He performed a back surgery on me, the first of its particular kind. And I thought it was the only of its particular kind until recently when I learned from the doctors there that they took that surgery that he invented for me uh -huh. and have used it now 13 times to save the lives of all the other jumpers off the Golden Gate Bridge wow. that have survived. Wow. So of 39 survivors, less than 1% of those who jump in the last, you know, almost a century, um, we all have the exact same back surgery. Same injury, yeah. yeah because wow. they, they, have, they have effectively lowered the, or raised the mortality level of jumpers off the Golden Gate Bridge because of this because surgery. Because of surgery, yeah. wow. Yeah. Wow. So I always look at life like I get to be here. Yeah. I get to be here and getting to be here is a privilege and a gift no matter the pain you might be in. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, I just have one question that I'm curious about. If you don't mind those four seconds. Yeah. Did, did that feel like eternity? Like did, did it feel like four seconds or did it feel like, what did, what did that feel like? Mm -hmm. It actually felt like less than four seconds. Okay. Mm. It felt like I went from the rail to the water immediately. Mm. Okay. The, the thing that occurs because the, the fog in the area is the, the fog when you're going that fast feels like shards of glass hitting your face. Um, mm. uh, it was, it was, uh, wow. uh, yeah, very scary. Yeah. I'm trying to process that even though I knew it. <laughs> I knew it going into this. Um, There's a couple added details I haven't heard before. Yeah, it's for sure. Um, my first thought that I have is I always say with, um, with my friend Jared, like with the loss, I feel like comes just like great purpose and value and drive because with like the loss of his life, it has now fueled a lot of what I do to do stuff and I'm able to help save people. And the same goes for you that, you know, you had this event. Not only are you saving people's lives by talking about what you went through, but you're literally saving people's lives because you broke your back. And now this doctor has the surgery that he's been able to use on so many people. Yeah. Like that's, that's not coincidence. You know, that's, that's divine timing right there Yeah. with that. Um, Okay, so we talk about all the time how Boite just absolutely loves the grocery store. Mm -hmm. He is the chef of the house. He will spend hours and hours in the grocery store. But yeah, my happy place. As you guys know, we've been traveling a lot and just 
very busy with all of our summer plans and summer travels. Um, so that's why we rely on companies like Green Chef to get us through the week. Yeah. Uh, Green Chef is the number one meal kit for eating clean. Uh, they have dinners that work around you, which is great because I'm all about clean eating, making sure we get, you know, that healthy stuff Yeah. in our diet. Uh, you can now choose from over 50 weekly menu and market items. They wow. have so many different things. Meats, fish, vegetarian options, lots of. A lot of options. A lot of options. I like yeah. that. They are not lacking. Everything comes pre-portioned. The ingredients are prepped. The sauces are pre-measured. Everything's clean, ready to go. Ready to go. Yeah. So really helps us when we're busy and you don't have time to go to the store. Everything's prepped and ready. You just got to put it together. Yeah. Green Chef has been so kind and shared a special code for us to share with you. Little lemon drops. Let's go. You can can go to greenchef.com slash thesqueeze50 and use code thesqueeze50 to get 50% off plus free shipping. 50? Uh Uh-huh. Five zero. Whoa. I know. I love I love it when we work with Green Chef and I think you guys are gonna like it too. Wow, take advantage of that one, yes. peeps. The squeeze fifty for fifty percent off plus free shipping. Click the link below. So you're there, you have your surgery. What was recovery like? Because not only are you physically recovering, but I'm sure you're mentally recovering and I don't know, like are you asking yourself like like God, why did it why why did you let me live like why am i living like what what was that time after like for you yeah so so you have to understand like it, it i i jump i live i'm i'm in the, i'm in the physical hospital four and a half five weeks going from a wheelchair to a walk and a back brace to a back brace and a cane after my 10 and a half hour back surgery to replace my shattered vertebrae with titanium and, and a metal plate and metal cage um and then for, into my first psych ward Mm -hmm. Uh, because you can't just go home after that, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that was brutal because there were so many people in there that were so seemingly much more broken than I was mentally. Um, And even the people I roomed with were just very, they were gone. Yeah. Yeah. And it was vicious. And, 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 you know, uh, even in California, uh, uh, straight jackets were illegal Mm -hmm. then, but they were still being used on all of us Mm. when we were out of line. And you'd be placed in, and I was placed in a white-walled padded room in a straight jacket um, which is the most restrictive thing you can imagine, which no one wants, right? Oof. Um, and then I would have 10 psych ward stays after that until 2019 pre-pandemic. But I will tell you that the most important psych ward stay for me was my third psych ward stay of 10. Okay. Mm. It was where I had what I call my epiphany and the gift. Okay. Mm. The epiphany came in the form of my uncle, George. He was my favorite uncle on my mom's side. Mm. Um, he was a character, big old barrel belly, and mm-hmm. he made everyone in our lives laugh with terribly inappropriate jokes and still does to this day. <laughs> but on that day he came to see me, he was in a really bad mood. It was my third psych ward stay and he and my family were done. Mm. And he comes in with a rolled up magazine in his right hand. And he's got, he's comes in on a special admit against visiting hours. And he goes, Kevin, your family can help you until we are blue in the face. But until and when, young man, you take 110% responsibility for the fact that you have this disease and you fight a tooth and nail, today, nothing going to change. Do you want to be in and out of these places for the rest of your life? And I said, no, Uncle George. And he goes, well, get it together, kid. We're counting on you. And he walked out. Wow. Dropped the magazine, said, read it, and walked out. I'm like, you're not my favorite uncle anymore. But he was already gone. <laughs> I pick up the magazine, Time Magazine article on how to fight bipolar depression, mental illness, and with re- regimen, routine, and win. Hmm. And I'm thinking, you mean I can do these things and I might actually feel better? Yeah. Why did my first three psychiatrists say anything about this routine and regimen stuff? Yeah. yeah. And so I, I read the magazine article twice, how to build a routine with mental illness. And I go to my case manager, Jana from Brooklyn, tough lady. <laughs> and I say, Jana, um, you've got me on 10 forms of therapy. And and give me five forms of therapy and something productive to do. I'm bored. And I, and I basically built a, a, a routine of like exercise, education, e- eating healthily, um, being honest in therapy. Who knew that was a good idea? You know, like <laughs> I just built a, a 10 step regimen on my own, but what I was going to do is change my world. And mm-hmm. I started getting better. And I'm in the hospital for two months because I'm waiting for a halfway home for the mentally ill. Nobody 
is willing to take me home. Not my family, not my friends. Nobody is willing to house me. It's either get into a halfway home for the mentally ill or be homeless. Mm -hmm. So in this third psych ward stay, and the gift came in this moment where uh, this young man rolls in on a gurney. He's catatonic, meaning he can't move and he can't talk. Methamphetamines and other drugs. He had an overdose. And he comes in on a gurney. And it, it really broke my heart because the staff of the hospital would not help him hmm. because he couldn't help himself. So they roll him in a wheelchair into the cafeteria for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And they'd leave him there in front of a tray of full food. And then the, when he couldn't eat it, they'd take that tray away full of food. He was starving. Yeah. And everybody else ignored him. Staff, patients. I would sit with him every day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and I would tell him stories with the hopes that I could elicit a response. Yeah. The most important part of this young man, his name is Eduardo, is that 15 to 22 people would come to visit him every day. Nobody comes to visit you at a psych ward. This kid had two entourages. It was beautiful. Filipino, Spanish, American family. Gorgeous family. Wow. Every single day they were there. They couldn't even get in during visiting hours at the same time. Only two were allowed during the, uh, and you switch off during the yeah. hour. So they're all in the tiny waiting room with the wired glass, putting their hands in the wired glass. Taking turns. Taking turns. Wow. With this catatonic kid who couldn't even respond to them. I'm talking to him every day, trying to get him to, to break out of his shell. Finally, one day he goes like this. Jesus Christ, man, you talk too much. I know your whole life story. Cut a guy a break. People are clapping in the background. I mean, it was just the lady that was always clapping, but she meant it for me. <laughs> <laughs> and and I'm, I'm thoroughly excited. Anyway, so I go, to the, I go to my case manager again. Jana, I need a job. She goes, you want to volunteer for the psych ward you're staying? I said, yes. She said, Kevin, that's highly unethical, probably illegal. That's not going to happen. I said, well, Jana, can I at least have a hug? She said, get away from me. <laughs> Jana goes on vacation the next day. Tough lady. <laughs> yeah, tough lady. Jana, Jana goes on vacation the next day, and the new case manager comes in. Certified San Francisco 1960s hippie. Huge salt and pepper hair out to here, curly fried and cued. Lay of flowers around her neck. She handpicked from her garden every morning and made herself flower in her right ear. Tie-dye shirts that she claimed were different every day. It was the same shirt she smelled. <laughs> she, claimed she, she, was... she had underarm hair. Um, <laughs> it was just her prerogative. That's fine. And, and so I end up uh, going to her. I'm like, hey, give me a job. And she's like, you want to volunteer for the psych ward? That sounds like a lovely idea. What can we have you do? And I said, and so she goes, she turns around. And she, they, they had left this lady alone at the nurse's psych ward station, which was huge. And it was dangerous. She goes to the row of binders, 22 giant green binders. She says, I know, you can file these. I said, what are they? She said, patient binders. You ever heard of HIPAA privacy laws, nurse? Can't, can't do that. She said, just do it alphabetically and don't look at the details. Don't look at the details. <laughs> oh my gosh. So I did it alphabetically and I didn't look at most of the details. <laughs> so I finished filing the binder. She gives me my next gig. Clean out the giveaway clothes closet. When people leave the hospital, they got something to wear. So I walk over there and I box, bin, label everything, separate it out. And I realize all the men's stuff sort of fits me. So I come out of the closet with a Ralph Lauren double-breasted polo suit and a 70s yellow flared collar like some kind of gangster who owns the place. <laughs> and I walk up to the nurse's psych ward station and I five-finger discount a notebook, clipboard, and pen and now I'm the official hospital documentee. It's just Leonardo the Ninja Turtle that I'm drawing. I still have that drawing. It's incredible. <laughs> and and I, I put it, you know, I'm working. I'm working there. It's my job. And the next day I'm wearing a pink polo shirt, khaki cargo shorts, and sandals right out the box from the giveaway clothes closet that fit me to the T. Wow. And I'm at the nurse's psych ward station. And if they've got one of those microphones that, you know, the drop down mics from a boxing ring uh -huh. looks like that, yeah. except with the stand on it. And, I, and I'm making the visiting hour announcements and I'm rhyming them because that's more efficient. <laughs> and I get a tap on my left shoulder. And there she was. Oh, no. Her eyes were almond brown, sexy and cool. And I was done. I was done. And I knew she'd be the rest of my life. I just didn't know how. And I was like, don't tell her that. That would be awkward. You just met her. And in front of the entire staff, everyone was like 20 people were there. She goes, excuse me, do you work here? Just like that. And I was like, I said, as a matter of fact, miss, I am a volunteer. <laughs> and, she, and they didn't say anything because I worked too hard. And she goes, I'm looking for my cousin, Eduardo. Do you know what room he's in? And I said, madam, right this way. And I put my hand on the small of her back and her elbow and I glided her there, which she said was later just creepy. <laughs> but I, I saw my dad do it once. But I get her to the room and the kid sees me and he hates me. I talk too much. Remember? And so this is her cousin. 
the kid at Waterloo, at the Catatonia. And he sees me and I duck out into the hallway trying to be slick. And she goes, your nursing staff is so nice because I'm the only patient not in the hospital gown. Right. And, and, um, and of course, the clipboard. And he goes, that guy? That guy's a nutball. That guy jumps off bridges. Don't talk to that guy. And I ran in there. I said, excuse me. It was one. One bridge. Whoa. One time. That's ridiculous. And she goes, why'd you lie to me? I said, Margaret, I didn't lie to you. I'm a volunteer at this very hospital. I just happen to also live here. And so, oh my gosh. so she comes out and, and she ends up visiting Eduardo like every day. And, and, uh, he's about to get out of the hospital and she comes in one day and I, I muster up all my courage and I stop her short at the hospital room door. I said, Margaret, when I get out of here, could, could I like take you to coffee? And she smiled at me. So I thought, oh, I got this. And she looks around at the H-shaped psych ward and she goes, oh, honey, hell no. <laughs> and I was destroyed, but I was persistent. And so, exactly. so the kid gets out of the hospital for me, right? Okay. He's doing well. Um, and by the way, he's sober and clean today. And he's incredible. Aww. So he gets out of the hospital and I get out and I go to my halfway home. I get into the halfway home. Well, I do my 30 days probationary period. Follow the rules to the tier. You're out of there. Okay. Yeah. I'm living off of $3 a day. Social security disability goes to the, goes to the house. I get, I get $3. Wow. Buys me a cup of coffee at Tully's or half of a bagel. If Pete at Noah's is nice to me, he wasn't always nice to me. <laughs> right? So I start saving up the $3 every day and eating the frozen food at the, at the, at the halfway home. I'm saving up the $3 to take Margaret out to dinner in my mind. Mm -hmm. I call mm -hmm. Margaret 30 days into the, to the halfway home. I say, Margaret, it's Friday. I'd like to take you to dinner. She goes, um... Uh, she was just so thrilled she couldn't find the words. Yeah. <laughs> I said, Margaret, exactly. it's a date. If it goes south, you never have to see me again. She goes, oh, okay. I was so excited. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so I show up at Margaret's apartment and I made a massive mistake. Um, I show up at Margaret's apartment with a giant ski duffel bag of lots of my things. And she goes, what is that? I said, Margaret, it's a, it's a, it's a halfway home. When you leave the halfway home on Friday, it's Friday. You can't go out past 9 p.m. You made reservations at 9. Here's the thing. You, I, I can't really go back to the halfway home until Monday. <laughs> and she goes, oh, hell no. That was like your favorite saying. And, your favorite and saying. so I'm like, oh my God, Margaret, I will lay on those Lombardi stairs. I will sleep on those stairs with this bag as my pillow and a jacket as my blanket in the rain if I have to tonight. Yeah. We have to go on this date. I came all this way. And she goes, oh God, fine. We go to this restaurant she made reservations at, Cafe Sport in San Francisco. You don't order at Cafe Sport. They order for you. You better not have allergies. I have lots of allergies. <laughs> they go to Cafe Sport. It, you, these tables are this big, right? They're, they're this big. They're tiny. And you're elbow to elbow with everybody there. You, 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 you can hear everybody's conversation verbatim. And they knew Margaret very well. She brought all her dates there. <laughs> I was the new guy. Mm -hmm. They get Margaret in a small, quaint, clean eggplant Parmesan meal. Fits on his tiny plate. On my side of the table, this guy obviously didn't like me. He puts a mountain of a marinara sauce, a huge thing of spaghetti, a huge uncracked lobster, a votive camel and plate with boiling butter on top, and a very large, oddly cut lemon wedge, like on purpose. And huh. I'm freaking out. I'm in my only good white shirt. I bought an Old Navy on sale on the clearance rack for $5. <laughs> That's a two-day shirt. Yeah. I'm totally losing it because if I get anything on this shirt, she's going to think I'm a slob. The date is done. Yeah. So... Uh, I go to my, I say to myself, my mantra was, Kevin, you can do this. I believe in you. Go. I take the cracker to the tail. Crack. Marinara sauce all over. My only good white shirt. It was like Captain America's shield on a shirt. I know I have that shirt. And I'm thinking, she thinks I'm a slob. I asked her later. She was like, you look like a slob. And so I say, Kevin, do something classy right now. And I remember saying, I said, what does that mean? Well, figure it out. So I take the lemon wedge. My hand was shaking because I had the onset of tardive dyskinesia because of my pills, which mm -hmm. makes your hands uh, twitch uncontrollably. Okay. And I'm holding the, the lemon and I'm looking at my hand, looking at Margaret, looking at the lemon, and I go like this. And I squeeze the lemon harder than a lemon has ever been squeezed. <laughs> and we're on the squeeze, so it makes sense. Yeah. And I watch a stream of lemon juice fly across the table into her left eye. And it just keeps going like a fire hose. <laughs> Mascara is running down her face. She looks like the band Kiss, the film The Crow. Yeah. I'm freaking out. I said, Margaret, I'm so sorry, but my brain does it again. Kevin, do something even more classy right now, or this is over. So I go for the plate of boiling butter with the same shaky hand. I tip the plate. 
droplets of boiling butter fly across, four or five droplets of butter fly across the table between her blouse onto her chest. They burn her. She screams bloody murder. People are dropping their knives and forced. The restaurant goes cold. And I'm, I'm like, oh my God. And she, the, the scream is so loud. But I, was, I freaked out and I grab my napkin and I reach over. And now I'm doing this on a first date. <laughs> And, and she looks down and she goes, what are you doing? <laughs> and I realized what I did. And I was like, oh my God, I have no idea what I'm doing. She goes, she says, the only f- words on a first date you never want to hear in the first 10 minutes when you haven't eaten your food. Check, please. <clears throat> now I had saved up my money, but I had no amount of money to pay for that lobster. Yeah. She foots the bill. I was so embarrassed. We leave the restaurant. She's walking a mile in front of me like, I do not know that guy. We get to the apartment. She looks at the bag and she goes, Kevin, we are going to the roof. And I said, Margaret, are you going to throw me off? And she said, no, come on. We go up this rickety old 1950s elevator. We get to the roof, two purple yoga mats, a box garden, the beautiful Bay Bridge in front of us, a moon, full moon lighting the sky, the Golden Gate Bridge behind us. And she goes, Kevin, lay down. We lay down. I said, Margaret, what are we doing here? She said, Kevin, if all we do right now is stare at that moon, ain't nothing else can go wrong. And then she turns to me and she says, so tell me your story. Mm. And I start telling my story. In five minutes, she was asleep. (laughs) So thank you for not sleeping. (laughs) (laughs) The moral of the story is not to brag about my love life, but we go on a second date. She gave me a second date. Yeah, I was going to say, and how are we yeah, sitting here today, folks? <laughs> we had a second date, and just this weekend, we had our 16-year wedding anniversary. Mm. And I tell you the story because she is my best friend, my hero, my heart, my everything. And the reason I have survived chronic suicidal thoughts mm. for the last 20 years is because of Margaret Hines. Mm. She's the greatest thing that has ever happened to me. Mm. And I feel like, you know, people said I was the luckiest man in the world to survive the Golden Gate Bridge. I'm not. Mm. I'm the luckiest man in the world to have Margaret Hines. Mm. She's my greatest gift. Um, mm. And without her, I wouldn't be alive a thousand times. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I just, uh, mm. we're working with producers right now on a scripted film version of the story, mm. narrative film. And, uh, yeah, after the writer's strike is over, uh, we're, we're, we're going to uh, attach writers and, um, and officially be in development, and we all can't wait to begin. And I, I'm just so blessed to, to be sitting with both of you, because I never thought this would be possible. Every moment I get past the day I should have died is a gift. Mm. Every millisecond I get to breathe is a gift. Every person I get to meet is a gift. Yeah. So thank you very much for having me on this show. Of mm. course. Of course. Well, I did not know your guys' story. Yeah. So that was... That's so fun. So Eduardo is your cousin. Wow. Did not see that twist coming. I, I, I was on the edge of my seat when he said, looked into those brown eyes. And uh-huh. I was like, oh... I was like, we're talking about the brown eyes that I think we are talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Your ability to like. Yeah. Just like laugh in about literally like you're cracking jokes as you're saying, oh, I didn't die from jumping off a bridge. I'm going to die from a shark now. Like <laughs> how, like how do you, how do you do that? Like, it's so cool that you're able to do that. You have to find humor in the pain. Yeah. Yeah. Because look, if I go to a speech and, and, you know, I travel 250 days a year telling my story. If I go to a speech and I leave the audience in pain, I've done, my, I've not done my job. I've done a terrible job. Yeah. yeah. I can't do that. You know, it, I have to go to a speech and I have to bring levity at every turn because how else are we going to hear this really? It's, it's a really, it's a hard story to hear when you really yeah. break it. Like, like the, from the infancy to, I mean, you know, uh, I've been drinking till blackout in high school until I was 21. I went had alcohol poisoning and, uh, and, and I, I, I stopped, I, I haven't touched alcohol since my, my 21st birthday because of mm-hmm. that alcohol poisoning. Like, like there's mm-hmm. so many aspects of the story. And I think that's what 
I think that's what why people relate to it. Yeah. Because there's so many different things, foster care, um, birth parent, you know, the whole, the whole, the whole story affects somebody in some yeah. way. Um, or you or you meet people who lost loved ones to suicide. And like to people who have lost loved ones to suicide, I always say, you know, hear me right now. It was not your fault. They didn't die because of you or in spite of you or something you said. They died because of a lethal emotional pain that had nothing to do with you. Yeah. My sister blamed herself for the next 15 years from what I did. Mm -hmm. She became homeless because of it. You know, she nearly lost her life because of it, oh. you know, and, and, and someone saved her in her most dire moment, you know, mm. you know, the, those three questions I said, are you okay? Is something wrong? Can I help you? The questions I wanted desperately to be asked when I left off the Golden Gate Bridge, somebody walked up to my sister in her moment right before she was going to kill herself and said, are you okay? And can I help you? And that woman wow. saved my sister's life. Wow. We gave her a home housed her, clothed her, fed her, saved her life in every aspect uh, that you could possibly imagine. Yeah. You know, and, and so, you know, if we just take away from this story that kindness and compassion, no matter what the person believes in, where they yeah. come from, what gender they are, what race they are, no matter any of that crap, no matter if they judge you, don't judge them. You don't know what they've been through. Yeah, for sure. You know nothing of what they've been through or what they're going through. Yeah. Just be kind, compassionate, loving, caring, empathetic, and non-judgmental to every person you come across. Yeah. Yeah. Every person, no matter what. Yeah. Because that kindness can go a long way. Yeah. I did a speech at the Lollapalooza of the crisis text line years ago. And, um, and I told this story and I, and, I, and I talked about if you see that person on that park bench or that, uh, or that bus bench and they're crying and their heads in their hands and they're in, in a desperate amount of pain, don't walk by them anymore. Yeah. Walk up to them and say something. You could save their life. And I got a message three weeks later from one of the people at that speech. And she said she walked home from getting groceries at Trader Joe's and she walks almost into her house and she sees a guy at the bus bench across from her, her apartment, crying his eyes out mm. like a baby grown man. And she walks in her house, puts her groceries away, looks out the window. He's still crying. And she goes, wait a minute. Kevin told me to say something. And she walks up to him and she goes, she just was so kind about it. She goes, and this is a way to do it. She goes, hey, hey, kid, you're breaking my heart. What's going on? Yeah. Literally those words. And he goes, what? Why do you care? And she goes, because you're human and so am I. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she sits down next to him and she goes, what's going on? And he said, my fiance just left me for another another man. And, and I don't know what to do with myself. I think I'm going to kill myself. And she said, please don't. I work with the crisis text line. Let me help you. Mm. And she sat with him for hours until she knew he was safe. Wow. Why can't we all do that for people? Yeah. Why can't we all be that person? Yeah. What's stopping us? Yeah. Suicide prevention is everybody's responsibility. Yeah. 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 That's so true. And I feel like so many people are it's scary because it's like unknown thing. They think you need to ask, like, do you want to commit to like, they think you need to ask that, but it's really just those simple questions. And I know for me, even with nursing, like when we do like the crisis scale on people, you have to like ask them those questions. Yeah. And I've always just thought there's a different way to like approach it. Obviously when you're like medically, there is a way to do it, but I never felt comfortable doing it. And I always questioned like, how am I going to approach someone yeah. and say that? Like, I feel yeah. very uncomfortable asking my patient if like, if they're debating, like taking their life right now, if they, you know, there's a, there's a way to do it, which I think a lot of people don't fully understand that it's literally just like pausing and talking to someone and just having an actual human conversation and asking a simple question. Are you okay? Like what's yeah. wrong? Mm -hmm. Like checking in with someone. I think, I think parents often ask me, like, what do I say to my teenager to ask? How do I start that conversation? Yeah. I'll say this first. The question, the conversation needs to be had at the breakfast, lunch, and dinner table of every home on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. More teens and children are dying by suicide than ever before in the history of this world. More yeah. seven to 10 year old children mm -hmm. are dying by suicide than ever before in the history of this world. More, more five to 10 year old black children are dying by suicide than ever before in the history of this world. Wow. And so we have to look at our children who are being destroyed uh, by pain. And we have to, we have to say it in a calm way, hey, 
And if you're in the hospital, it's like this, like, hey, um, you know, I, I, I don't want to offend you, but I'm worried about you. Yeah. I'm worried about some of the things you've been exhibiting. And I want to ask you a couple of questions. But before I ask you those questions, I want you to be 100% honest with your response. Mm -hmm. You're not in any trouble. These are important questions. They matter and you matter. Okay, mm -hmm. here we go. Are you thinking of killing yourself? Have you ever made plans to take your life? Do you right now have the means to do so? Mm -hmm. Wait for the response. If the response is no, what do you, why would you ask me that? Great. There you go. Great, quite, great answer. They're safe. Mm -hmm. You're not going to put the thought in their mind. But if the answer is like, how did you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, elaborate. What, what, what do I know? Well, I was thinking about uh, taking my life and I, and I, and I did have a plan and I, and I do have the means. Mm -hmm. Okay. What, what is bringing you to that conclusion? Why do you think mm -hmm. you have to take your life? Yeah. Extend the conversation. Don't yeah. shut it off. Don't make them feel judged. Don't tell them they're wrong. Millions of people around the world have suicidal thoughts. Yeah. Millions upon millions. Yeah. They're not bad people. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with them. Don't make them feel stupid. It is for feeling normal. That way. Normalize the yeah. conversation. Yeah, exactly, Taylor. Normalize the conversation. Yeah. Courage, normalize, question, recovery, conquer. Mm. Courage to talk about your mental health. Normalize the conversation. Ask those three questions. Are you thinking of killing yourself? Having me plan to save your life? Do you have the means? Recovery are is living proof. Yeah. I'm living proof. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, you know, the biggest thing people don't like get wrong about me, I think, when I when I meet them in person, um, is they think I'm healed and recovered. Right. I'm not recovered. Right. Yeah. I'm in like recovery, like one would be from substance use, or like my birth parents would be if they were still alive. Like I'm in recovery every day. I yeah. struggle every day. I'm struggling now. Yeah. I have paranoid delusions. I have hallucinations. I have depressions. I have many, I have it all. Yeah. But I have the tools to cope with it and to always survive it. Yeah. The two things I do every time I'm suicidal and I'm suicidal uh, a lot of the time. Mm. Chronic thoughts of suicide. They plague me. Mm. Two things I do every time. Two things I teach people around the world to do. Find a mirror, any mirror, anywhere. Look in that mirror and say these words. My thoughts do not have to become my actions. They can simply be my thoughts. Mm. The second thing you need to do is turn to the closest person to you and say four simple but very effective words. I need help now. Mm -hmm. Make that your shorthand for when you're suicidal. Tell everybody who loves you what that shorthand is so they know what to do. Mm -hmm. I need help now. And if you don't know the person, it doesn't mean they can't help you. It mm -hmm. means you need to work and say those words until you find someone willing to empathize. Don't stop until you find that person mm -hmm. yeah. or those people. Yeah. Say it until you get the help you need. Yeah. yeah. And for the people listening who, who, who think that someone might say that to them and, and the people listening who have someone come to them and say they're suicidal, my suggestion is to sit with them. Mm -hmm. Just physically be there. Open your ears. Listen to understand, not to respond. Yeah. Mm. Hear what they're going through. Yeah. yeah. Feel what they're going through. And let them know there are other options. Yeah. Let them know that hope is on around the corner. But you have to put in the hard work, the effort, and the time and the energy to get to that hope. Yeah. Mm. It doesn't just come naturally for all of us. Right. And not everybody has a support network like I have. But I didn't always have a support network when my family abandoned me. For sure. I built that. Yeah. Mm. I created that. Yeah. So every technique, every tool you can learn, Google University, YouTube University, do your homework. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go to my channel. I've got 700 videos designed to help you better your brain health. Yeah. Take them. They're free. They're yours. Yeah. You know, like... We have to be willing to learn from others how yeah. to survive for ourselves. Yeah. And if, if we are truly alone, if we truly have no one, mm -hmm. we have to become our best advocate. We have to be the ones that say, I'm not going to let these thoughts take me from this world. I deserve to be here until my natural end, never to die in my hands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of perspective and perception. Change yours yeah. now. Yeah. Wow. I love listen to understand and not to respond because I think 
Yeah. I, so many people just need to be hurt. Yeah. I mean, it was like you on that day, that morning. Like you just, if you would have been heard, it might have prevented that. And I think that's just like listening to people and just letting them know that, you know, there's there's people out there that, you know, want to hear what they're going through and just care what they're going through. Like yeah. that alone can help save lives. Yeah, that's so true. Um, you've petitioned in the past about this net surrounding the Golden Gate. And I believe you probably can update me. Is that coming to completion this year? Has it yet? And what were your first thoughts when you heard that they were going to do it and you saw that net for the first time? So there has been an 87 year multiple effort wow. to raise the rail or net at the Golden Gate Bridge. I didn't know that. Seven one. fights that failed. Wow. One fight that is succeeding. Wow. In 2006, the film The Bridge came out by Eric Steele. Mm -hmm. My father and I were featured in it, documentary, for 10 minutes. Okay. Um, it was said and claimed by many to be the most uh, poignant part of the film. The film goes on to be critically acclaimed and then also damned by people who didn't get what he was doing. Mm. Um, but he showed people dying off the Golden Gate Bridge mm. and said, why is this happening? What are we going to do about it? There was no bias in the film, pure and simple. These people are dying. It's a public health crisis. Why do we allow it to still go on? Yeah. My father, Paul Muller, and Dave Hall founded the Bridge Rail Foundation right after that film came out. Mm. I was a founding board member. We fought for 23 years to raise the net at the Golden Gate Bridge to effectively stop the suicides there forever. Yeah. The net was approved on June 27, 2014. Delays ensued all the way until now. Wow. It is 70% complete across the bridge. That is 360,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. It will be done by December of this year. Wow. Not one more soul will ever again die off the Golden Gate Bridge, and it will become the largest, brightest, most powerful beacon for suicide prevention right around the world. Wow. It's going to be incredible. We all worked for so long to make this happen. A great wow. group of small people, small group of like-minded people got together and said no more. Um, and consequently, we're making a film called The Net, a documentary uh, about the, uh, the journey to, to this point. Uh, it's going to be one of the most historic uh, films of its kind because nothing like this has ever been done yeah. on the most frequented spot for suicide in the world. Yeah. This is one of the most special things I've ever been involved in. Can't imagine. And um, I can't wait for The Net to be done so that no one else has to die at the Golden Gate Bridge. And now what's happening is because of this fight, the Bridge Rail Foundation is opening up itself up to teach people how to change policy. We change policy here. We can do it anywhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To change policy in tall building structures, building bridges, and railways to stop suicides around the world by reduction of access to lethal means, which we know saves lives. Why? Because when you show people in a community that you care, Yeah. It sends a message to the rest of the people. When they put up a net of railing at a bridge, suicides drop there to zero. They drop in the metropolitan counties around that area because you've shown people a community that you care mm -hmm. and that people matter. Yeah. And that they're important, that they're valued, that they're loved. Yeah. And they actually see what happens in those places and they go, I need help now. And they get it. Yeah. Yeah. Because I imagine sometimes it just it takes that that moment like it's back to yeah just realizing that people care and just seeing that alone could change somebody's mindset that's really special um that's unbelievable as a matter of fact i'm happy to say there's already been one save someone didn't realize there was a net jumped in the net part part of it and, and was saved the next day wow yeah wow that's truly amazing <laughs> never say sorry for crying <laughs> that's why we have tear dust <laughs> you know chimpanzees don't have tear dust no but they want to cry but they can't really isn't that sad never heard that no that is sad. very sad that is very sad, sad right yeah i don't oh. like that <laughs> oh. sorry i'm not gonna keep saying sorry <laughs> stop <laughs> saying sorry <laughs> oh. i know that just got me thinking because you know Jared 
um, he jumped from the top of the parking structure. So oh, it's like man. there was a net there. Yeah. But it's so cool that that gets to save a lot of people's lives. Yeah. Ugh, sorry. You want to talk? <laughs> <laughs> um, you and your wife have your foundation. Can you tell us a little bit about what you guys do? Because you guys are really changing the game and changing the world. So uh, we, we travel the world uh, sharing stories uh, to all, all walks of life. You know, um, one, one of the biggest things we, we do is work with the military. Mm-hmm. Um, and we do that because uh, so many of our servicemen and women are dying by suicide every day. Um, you know, the, the number is 22 a day, but it's far more than that because it's so underreported. <laughs> yeah. And we work with law enforcement because it's a huge, uh, a huge uh, death rate for suicide. Doctors and lawyers, huge death rate for suicide. We work with them as well. Mm. And, and we, we actually, uh, we gave uh, scholarships for youth to go to suicide prevention conferences and, and try to be, to join the field, to become therapists and clinicians and doctors. Huh. Um, so we've done a lot of that work. Um, um, uh, but we are, uh, focused with all that we're doing more on our film endeavors and creating content that, uh, is science backed, evidence informed, proven to change people's minds, perspectives, and perceptions so that when they're suicidal, they can watch these videos and films mm. and choose life. We made a film called suicide, the ripple effect a few years ago. Um, it, it came out in 2018. It's been credited with saving over 700 lives. It's been seen by 2 million people in 20 different countries. And that's why we're continuing to make documentary films that yeah. have that similar effect. Yeah. Um, but obviously with, with all that work, we need help to do it and, and to scale it. And so we're looking for people around the world who have the same mission, who help to fund these projects. And, yeah. um, and, and they're, they're vast and they're expansive, but you have to understand that they are absolutely saving lives. We don't call ourselves lifesavers. Like, like we're, I'm a conduit. I give a message. Yeah. I, I give a message. People go home, they do the work. They're really saving and changing their own lives. Mm-hmm. I'm just the, the guy that got them to think about what they're going to do to change their position in life. Um, that's how I see it. But, but I can say that people credit us in these films with saving their lives. And as far as the YouTube channel is concerned, we get thousands of letters saying that this or that video saved my life. And then the people write it and they say, this video saved my life and continues every time I've become suicidal because I'm learning that so many people have chronic suicidality, but they never knew how to say it out loud. They never used the the terminology before, chronic suicidal thoughts, which people don't really understand, but they're, they're thinking of putting it into the next DSM, uh, uh, on, um, on, on mental illness. And so it's, it's, it's in the handbook of mental illnesses. So it's going to be, um, a continued effort, uh, until, we die of natural causes, never by our hands mm. to make these films and these types of viral videos so that they um, can have an effect on lives and change lives uh, forever. And when I, when I think about the, the impact it's had, um, personally, hundreds of thousands of people have written to me and said, the video I saw, the story you shared, the speech you gave, or, or seeing you in person yeah. saved my life. And there's nothing more therapeutic in the world than something like that. Yeah. I I actually stopped going to therapy regularly because I get so much from my family and friends and from the people who come see me that I, 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 I'm not saying I don't need therapy. I love to talk. You can tell, but, but I love therapy, but, but I don't need to do it. Now I do it once a month or something. I don't do it every week now because, um, because I volunteer for a cause that is bigger than myself. And when people volunteer for a cause, they're 63% more mentally healthy than those that do not. Mm -hmm. So give back wherever you can. Yeah. You know? Um, So we we, we do a lot in that realm and and we're working very hard to make those things real and and to have them change lives. We're working on some projects with addictions and and substance use issues and obviously mental health. We try to do it in subtle, moderate, mild to somewhat overt. You know, it depends on the project. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow so special guys yeah if there is somebody listening right now at this moment that is you know struggling with the thought of taking their life what would you say to them for all of you right now who are listening viewing watching who are considering dying by suicide stop take a breath take 30 more resonance breaths 
in through your nose for four seconds. Hold for four seconds. Release six to eight seconds with pursed lips like a whistle but no sound. Do it 30 or more times. Bring your body and your mind to a calm. It will, I promise. Breathe. We're all going to pass away someday. None of us have cracked the code to immortality. I beg of you, please give yourself time plus hard work for things to change. There is no uberfication of your wellness. There's no one pill to take. There's no one exercise to do. You will only improve 1% a day with effort, energy, and time. You deserve this life until your natural end. You are beautiful just as you are. You are a thousand times greater than the worst thing you ever have done. You're meant to be here. Please, please stay. Be here tomorrow and every single day after that. And if nobody else says it today, we love you and we want you to stay. We love you. Yes, we do love you. And Kevin, we love you. And we are so thankful for you and for your story and for the work that you do. And thank you for being here. And thank you for being here. Yeah. Um, thank you for um, just sharing your story continuously and inspiring people and um, just doing what you do. You're a very special human being. And we are beyond thankful to have you and to have met you here in person. Of course. Mm. Ditto. Well... Thank you, Kevin, for sharing your story with all of us and being so um, vulnerable. And um, I mean, I was holding back tears there. I don't even know. <laughs> I, even I didn't I hold back. back. Yeah. I couldn't <laughs> hold back tears. I know. Um, yeah. I mean, I talked about it a little bit during the interview, but parallels that, you know, Kevin's story has to my friend Jared, who unfortunately isn't with us anymore, um, definitely kind of took over me and are creeping in as I'm talking about it now. Yeah. Um, but it's just so cool that, you know, Kevin's like, he's here today. He's living. He's gets to share, you know, his story and just help save so many lives. Oh, yeah. He's and truly educate changing the world. I yeah. Mean, saving lives on yeah. the daily. Yeah. And we, then once this net yeah. Is fully complete. I mean, it's yeah. already yeah. saved somebody's life, but yeah, it's he's just, it's, it's, it's just amazing. It's truly really like at a loss for words. And we're so thankful for Kevin. Um, again, and again, um, if you guys have any more questions about it, thoughts, want to further your education on suicide and suicidal ideation, head to our previous episode with Dr. Chase Anderson. It's the second half of our episode. We kind of go over the basics there so highly encourage you guys to do that as always make sure you guys subscribe and are following us you can email us at lautner.thesqueezepodcast at gmail.com for any stories comments concerns uh last episode we introduced our tea time with tay so if you guys need mm -hmm. any life advice any requests on anything anything you guys want us to talk about you can send it there you can leave it in the comments below um we always do question boxes on our Instagram at the squeeze. Uh, we newly have a TikTok called Let's at go. the squeeze podcast. So lots of, lots of social media for you guys to check out and be inspired um, and get some good, you know, wholesome, encouraging content. Yeah. But we're very thankful for you guys. I hope you have an amazing rest of your day. Woo. Yeah. And go take that workout class because um, <laughs> I did it and you can do it too. And we'll see you guys next week. All right. See ya. This podcast has been brought to you by Podcast Nation.